This is Talking Drupal, a weekly chat about web design development from a group of people with one thing in common. We love Drupal. This is episode 407, Better Drupal Switch. Welcome to Talking Drupal. Today we're talking about how to improve Drupal search with Sean Walsh. Sean has been working with Drupal since 2009. He builds and maintains sites for higher education and nonprofit clients. He organizes Drupal Camp New Jersey and the Central New Jersey Web Developers Meetup. Currently, he is the secretary of the Drupal Event Organizers Working Group and co-founder at CrowdCG. Sean, thanks for joining us for the last three weeks and thanks for chatting with us today. Thanks, it's been a privilege. I am John Picozzi, Solutions Architect at EPAM, and today my co-host is Nick Laughlin, founder at Enlightened Development. Good afternoon. Good morning. Happy to be here. It's a podcast, Nick. They could be listening at any time of day. So uh, let's jump into our drop-in for this week. Design for Drupal is this week. Uh, Leslie is here to tell us more. Design for Drupal Boston 2023 is being held July 20th to 21st, Thursday and Friday at Salem State University in Salem, Massachusetts. The conference is devoted to design, UX, front-end technologies, and business and process challenges. There is still time to register. This year is our 15th anniversary. Our keynote this year is Design for Longevity, Service Innovation Through System Thinking. It's with Sheng Hung Li from MIT's Age Lab. Uh, we have a lot of great sessions, boss, and trainings including some of the hottest topics in Drupal right now, single directory components with Mike Herschel, distribution of recipes with Jim Birch. Uh, we have Svelte JavaScript in Project Browser with Chris Wells. We also have uh, trainings, including Absolute Beginner's Guide to, to Drupal. That's a full day free training to learn Drupal. And then we have a lot of design, front end accessibility sessions as well. It's a really great lineup. Check it out, design number four drupal.org website. And there's a register link right there. $50 for both days, includes all the sessions and everything, trainings, breakfast, lunch, and an after party on Thursday. Would love to see you there. Thanks. Thanks, Leslie. Uh, Steven and I will be at Design for Drupal, so uh, feel free if you're a listener to uh, to say hi. Always love chatting with our listeners and uh, um, talking about stuff we've, we've talked about. So look forward to seeing folks out there in uh, Boston. Hey, which day are you going to be there? Both days or... I am going to be there both days. Yep. Yeah, I am. Uh, I'm heading up. Uh, I'll head up Thursday morning and then I'm staying over and I'll, I'll be there all day Friday. Awesome. All right. And now uh, let's talk about our module of the week. Let's turn it over to Martin Anderson Klutz, a senior solutions engineer at Acquia and maintainer of a number of modules, a growing number of modules of his own. Uh, Martin, what do you have for us this week? Thanks, John. This week, I thought we would talk about a brand new module, ECA Commerce, which provides events to the ECA module from all of the Commerce Core and submodules. It's a module that was actually created in just the last couple of weeks. It has currently a 1.0.0 Alpha 2 version, which works with Drupal 9 and 10. It was recently released by someone who will be familiar to listeners of this podcast, our own Nick Laughlin, along with Jurgen Haas as a co-maintainer. It currently has one site uh, in use of the, the module, according to Drupal.org, and has currently one open issue with no bugs. Now, the, the way that the module works for, you know, Listeners may, be, uh, may recall the in-depth discussion we had about ECA from episode 402. Really, this module adds events for working with Drupal Commerce. So whenever a, someone on the site updates a product, inserts a product variation, creates a promotion, you know, deletes a store, pays an order, a variety of other different kinds of things they might be doing on a Drupal site, now you can also make those part of an ECA workflow to sort of, you know, trigger emails or show different messages, lots of different ways that could be useful in terms of, of um, you know, making the site more interactive. So having these events available within ECA means that, you know, you really have that, that sort of uh, the power of ECA and in particular sort of the, you know, I would say, you know, visually customizing in the sense of like using a visual tool, that BPMN tool, 
um, to, to really build out some very custom functionality without having to write any custom code. Uh, Nick, why don't you tell us about what inspired you to create this module and, and what's been your experience in creating it? Yeah, so let's start with the, the second question, the experience creating it. It was actually pr pretty cool. So when Jurgen was on the show, he mentioned that he does the weekly live coding sessions on Fridays. And so I saw a need for this module and thought I'd join it. And we spent about an hour and 10 minutes running through kind of the scaffolding of the module. It showed me kind of a, a couple of examples of how you set up the, uh, some details for the, for the module. And I'll talk about those when I get to the features, but that was extremely helpful. And that really got me started. I was able to write the majority of the module in one morning. And then I spent another morning writing kind of the, the second half of it, I suppose you'd say. And he's been really, uh, really responsive to any questions that I have in the ECA channel. Um, but yeah, it's been, it, it was actually, you know, there was a lot to do because commerce is a huge ecosystem of modules and I have some ideas for things that can go in the future, but you know, the experience of writing, it was pretty great. As for the inspiration, I have a e-commerce client that I'm working for right now that needs, you know, one of the great things about Drupal and commerce had always been the rules module, the ability to set up notifications or tweak things. And, um, I know rules is technically available for nine and 10, but it never quite felt like it made the port or made the jump in to the full functionality that it had in seven. And there, there are a couple of things that I need to do with this project that are going to require some custom coding. So particularly I need to prevent certain rules from applying coupons or discounts, and I need to be able to change pricing for certain roles. And of course I could write some custom code for that and I may still need to, but I thought, you know, if I can expose all that stuff through ACA, through a custom module, that will help ECA adoption, help other people. Um, and, you know, it seems like a useful module. Um, and since we just had Jurgen on the show and he mentioned that he'd be willing to help out with that kind of stuff, I thought I'd put it to the test. The module kind of does two things right now. Um, it, one thing is it provides a listener for all the events that commerce, it's in all of the core commerce sub modules provide. So it provides listeners. You can add those as events in your ECA setup in your ECA models. And then I also added the reason why there's a, a point two release or an alpha two, I added all of the different tokens that are available. So for example, if you add a item to your cart, that entity is available to ECA now. One big caveat, there are several entities or several events that have more complex interactions that probably won't work. So for example, with the entity, with the cart, like that's pretty simple. Like the cart, like there's a bunch of stuff that's just provided by Drupal and ECA out of the box. I just say, this is the entity, this is the name. You can modify it and tweak it with tokens. There's a bunch that have their own setter methods or other methods. I didn't fully implement those, but I figured I would, I would add those as, as needed. One, one last thing I'll say is for our listeners out there, if you're looking to integrate with an ecosystem, I think this, I, there's a couple of clever things in the module that, um, Jurgen and I came up with to handle those types of situations. So for example, you need to know, like you, I, I didn't want to create a dependency on every single sub module in commerce. Uh, because otherwise, when you install, the, if you install this module, it's going to install every commerce module. You can't do that. But we also need to know that a module is enabled in order to integrate with it, right? So there's, I think there's a pretty clever solution in the module and checking to see which classes are available. And if the submodule class, event class is available, then we can integrate and listen to those events. Um, what that means is this submodule, as needed, can add support for other contributed commerce, like we're not going to need an ECA commerce, you know, pay, whatever payment gateway you're using module, we can add that support to this module safely. So I think, I think it's a pretty powerful system. Um, it's a great experience working with Jurgen. I'm sure I'll have additional questions. Hopefully people will use it, provide some feedback. Um, once, once I, uh, I'm going to be working on the functionality this week for that client. So hopefully it works. If not, I guess, I'll still maintain this module and I'll just write that custom code. Um, but 
once I once I set that up and confirm that it works, at least for a couple of use cases, I'll, I'll do a full release so it gets security coverage. But yeah, overall, it was a great experience. Yeah, I want to key in on, on one thing you said there, which is really around sort of, um, you know, Jürgen Haas, but really, I feel like the the group of people in the ECA community right now and, and their willingness to sort of jump in and help if you have a question. Anytime I've gone into their Slack channel in Drupal Slack, they've they've really been amazing in terms of being very responsive. Yeah, it's been it's been great. I think there was one other person on the call um, on the live coding session that we did. And and as you mentioned on the show, they're all recorded. So I think he's released this one. So if you're looking to um, there were a couple things that he ran into that were if he had it, it wasn't like he just showed me like here copy this code and do this you know there were a couple things that he ran into that because he had written eca he was able to get past pretty quickly and if i had been trying to do it myself would have taken probably enough effort that i probably would have just abandoned it and written the custom code because right writing custom code sometimes is easier right but because he was you know he was so available you know, I think this is something that will be much more valuable to the community at large. But yeah, every has been super responsive. Now, Nick, you mentioned that you had some ideas around kind of a future state for the module. Can you give us any insights into some things that might be available down the road? Yeah, so there's there's a few things in particular. One is I haven't integrated with any hooks. So you, Webform is an example of a module that uses hooks more than events. Um, you can create an event around a hook and then expose that to ECA. There's only two hooks, I think, in commerce and they're around altering certain forms. So I don't think that they're used all that much. So if somebody needs it, they can make a feature request and I'll do it. The other thing is better integration with certain entities. Like I said, Jurgen mentioned that if an event entity has special methods, many times you have to do some magic to make it work better. Um, for the moment, I just expose those. I expect that they won't work the way you would expect them to out of the box. Again, if somebody needs them, we can figure that out and add that support. But probably the biggest thing and the thing I'll probably do just as I have time is I'll add support for other e-commerce system, um, the subsystem, you know, contributed modules. Like I'm probably not going to go out and seek them all out, but if somebody needs one, create an issue and it's pretty straightforward at this point to, uh, you know, if there's an event, I can add that event to the list. Yeah. I mean, it, it's interesting to me because I'm, I'm been using commerce for a long time and like thinking of like, you know, commerce does have some ability, uh, out of the box to do kind of like conditional things with, um, coupons and stuff like that. But like having the, the ECA kind of the ab ability to build models and to be able to see them, I think is like, a lot easier in most cases for for you know site or store administrators to understand and kind of kind of work with. So I'm interested to uh, to dive into that and see see more about um, what you, what you guys did there. Yep, I'll report back. I guess once I've actually used the module I wrote. <laughs> there you go. But hopefully it works. Oh, I'm I'm sure it'll work. Um, thank you, Martin. Thank you, Nick, for, uh, for discussing this. Um, look forward to uh, hearing more about uh, ECA commerce in the future. See you next week. All right. Let's move on to our primary topic, um, talking about all things search, or at least all things Drupal search. Um, so let's, let's level set a little bit. I think we can all agree that Drupal core search isn't great out of the box. Um, however, uh, you know, there are things we can do to improve it um, and um, make it as good or, or some, in some cases better than some of the, the search, other search engines out there. So for our conversation today, we're going to kind of talk about some of those things that we can do that we can implement to, you know, improve uh, the search experience, both for the users and for, you know, indexing and all that stuff. But um, Sean, I guess the first question is, you know, 
where do we start with search? You know, what are the things um, you do to improve search on like a brand new Drupal site? That's a great question. So, I mean, I think one of the first things most of us do is install search API um, because that does give us, you know, a better way of even interacting with like core database search, right? Um, it helps us do indexing better. Uh, it helps us weight things, all these fun things that we can do um, with search API and, you know, you know, various ecosystem modules there really go a long way to making a better search experience uh, in Drupal. Um, we're going back to our content modeling discussion. A lot of it, too, is about like figuring out how you want to store your data, how what's what's going to be important to your search. Uh, and I think, you know, Core search is just kind of snippets, right? It's just like, here's your here's your title, here's your body or your summary, and that's all you really get out of the box. Uh, and so installing Search API gives you more tools than just you know your core fields. So I got a follow-up question there with Search API, right? You do have, a, and this kind of goes back to what you were just talking about with like content model. You do have options with Search API to like, kind of search like out the output h uh, outputted page of of of, a, of an entity right as opposed to those individual fields i think drupal core search and you guys can keep me honest here but i think drupal core search by default searches certain fields right tidy title field body field right um but search api does give you the ability to kind of like search and like a rendered page as opposed to just certain fields is there one that you prefer over another um, and and why? Uh, that's a good question. I mean, I think it depends as all all things Drupal. <laughs> right. Uh, right. You know, uh, sometimes the output of the page is fine um, in the rendered HTML, but sometimes there's like hidden fields that like are tagging, right? That do have, you know, weight, no pun intended, to what you want your search relevance to be, right? And so right. I think uh, you know, can't just a lot of times it's not just what's on the page uh, or the order of how things are spit out on the page isn't the order of how they should impact the search. Right. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think th that's pretty important. I think one of the nice things about the rendered um, option is that if you're pulling in other pieces of content that are relevant, you you can group them into one thing. Now, I will say. Drupal 10.1 has some issues with rendering the content in Search API. Um, there are, it's very noisy in the logs. In fact, on a, I just pulled it out of a project that it wasn't doing anything particularly critical in that project. And it was making the logs so messy and slowing the search indexing down so much that I, I just pulled it out. Um, there's an open, I'll put this in the show notes, but there's an open issue trying to look into what's going on. But I think it has something to do with big pipe just starting a session and it's it's trying to start a session when it's rendering the page. Um, but I, I, I think there's, there's a couple of really big things that Search API does too that are important to note. Um, one is, um, and you, you kind of alluded to this, John, but I think it's worth pointing out, you can weight things based on um, how important things are. So you might say, hey, the title's if something shows up in the title and the body field of two different nodes, well, the one where it shows up in the title is more important. Show that first. So it'll show both of them, but it'll show the one with the term in the title first. Um, you can remove uh, certain words like a and the from the indexing. You can, if you're doing, depending on what backend you're using, you can set up Porter Stemmer so you can convert talking to talk, right? Um, or vice versa. So there's a lot of control that you can do there. But one of the other things that I think is, I think it changed for Drupal from seven to eight, but you can assign indexes to different server backends. So if you're testing, and we'll talk about backends in a minute, but if you're testing different backends or you have different backends for production or uh, dev, then you can, you can use a lot of the same configuration, just be like, hey, I want to see how, you know, this backend does versus that backend for performance. And you don't have to reconfigure all of the different indexed fields um, and, and rules. You can just kind of move them over, which is nice. Definitely. 
I mean, I think that's that's the key thing here with the fact that it's an API for search. It unifies some of that stuff, and makes life a lot simpler, uh, like you're saying. Okay, so speaking of search backends, there are um, four or five backends that are, you know, kind of common in Drupal. The first one is database backend, right? So you can use, if you don't want to use an external service or a search specific thing, you can just use the Drupal database. Um, are there any any caveats or, you know, anything that people should be aware of if they're using the database? I mean, like like any database things, like, you know, resources, right? I think it's probably the big thing to think about there, right? If you're hitting your actual website database for search and you have a lot of traffic and, you know, you're getting lots of unique searches, you know, there's going to be potential performance impact, different things that could go on there. Um, your database will get very large yes. very quickly too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, I, you know, for sure there's there's definitely... Lots of considerations there. And I think database search is fine for small sites that just need something a little bit better than core, right? Yeah. I, I don't think everybody needs, you know, uh, another another more search focused backend. If, you know, you've got like 100 pieces of content on your website and you just yeah. want to have a nice, you know, search UI um, yeah. for those things. I mean, or to, be clear, to be clear, okay. though, core search also uses the database. It's just search API has the ability mm -hmm. to, yeah. to kind of point to the, to the database as well, right? Yeah. And I would say database is also really good for a fallback um, or kind of a transitionary period. So I had a client where the Elasticsearch, uh, which we'll talk about in a second, but Elasticsearch went away and we were able to just create a database server backend, put the index there, re-index and have search back up while we figured out what was going on with Elasticsearch. Or if you're transitioning um, something else, like I had another client that was switching hosts and the new host mm -hmm. didn't have the particular system that they were working on. So there was a short period of time where we were using database search. So it's database search as far as setup, it is one of the easiest, right? You just kind of turn on it and it works as long as you have the resources and space available. Yep. Um, I think the next one that is probably one of the more common in Drupal, at least historically, is solar. Mm -hmm. uh, in, any, any comments about solar? Yeah, I mean, solar, I think, has a long story in Drupal land, right? Like everything kind of started from the Apache solar module, I think was Drupal 6, 7, right? Um, yep. And then, you know, Acquia provides solar as a service, Pantheon provides solar as a service. Yep. Don't know these days what platform su supplies and some of the other ones, but you know, solar is definitely one of the ones that um, you know had the most traction, I would say, in the Drupal ecosystem uh, of yeah. sites. Um, and because you know it ships bundled with most of these services, that's what a lot of people implement. Yep. Um, I think there's a lot of like terminology you need to understand with solar that maybe you don't need to know from some of the other backends that are more um commercial let's put it that way that's probably the easiest way to say it right like the some of the lingo is a little bit less nebulous uh in some of these other things um but you know i mean solar since it's been used by like so many sites you know there's great documentation there's there's a lot of modules that extend it right so like there's there's benefits to it from that perspective and once you kind of understand what it's doing and the configuration, I think is probably the most painful thing. Configuration yeah. and then debugging why something came back when you don't expect it. <laughs> yeah, so, I should yeah, say. I, mean, yeah. I, I think the highlight there, right, is it's highly customizable, mm -hmm. which is is a double edged sword, right? It's a good thing, but it also can be um, overly customized to the point where it becomes a little bit a little bit difficult to kind of get to some of your. Uh, your more precise search queries. Yeah, and so Solar is an Apache Foundation project that's built on top of Lucene, which is another Apache Foundation project. So it's it's open source, which is, I think, one of the reasons why the Drupal mm -hmm. community latched onto it pretty early. Um, it's Java-based. It's pretty, you have to have quite a few resources for that as well, but it is fast. And, and like you said, Sean, it's, it's well-documented. Okay, next we have Elasticsearch. So I haven't used this directly in Drupal as a backend, but I've used Elasticsearch for other things. 
um, like in WordPress land, Jetpack search is Elasticsearch, right? Um, I've used it for some custom application stuff um, where the search interface is Elasticsearch based, but it's not actually touching Drupal at all. Again, you know, it's about where you're storing your data, where you're acquiring your data from, the, AP, the API, the tools and resources you have available to it. Um, yeah. You know, uh, Nick, do you have experience with Elasticsearch? I do, both inside and outside of Drupal. It, it shares a lot of characteristics with Solar. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's a little bit more actively maintained, I guess you would say. I mean, both are incredibly stable. Um, I found the biggest issue with Elasticsearch is similar to the one with Solar in that it's resource intensive, not just because it's a search product, but it's Java and Java just by default tends to require more resources for things. Um, in fact, I will talk about this. And I, I, this is the show of me doing uh, throw ahead comments, I guess, but um, <laughs> I, I just, I just switched away from Elasticsearch for a client. Um, and the reason for that was a, there were a few reasons for it. One is um, it's a, not for a client, for a side project that I'm working on. One is the server itself had pretty limited resources and more than two and a half gigabytes of the memory was being used by Elasticsearch, even though it was barely ever, I was barely ever actually running searches. I was, I kept running into cluster availability issues just because it was resource starved, even though it was on a very, like the only person accessing the site is me because it's a side project for fun. It's a hobby. So it really shouldn't be resource constrained. Um, there are a bunch of little issues with Elasticsearch and Elasticsearch connector in Drupal 10 indexing randomly fails. Um, and I've opened a couple of issues and tried to bug it. Some of it is just because there's, it ran out of resources, but a bunch of little edge case. And like, for example, if I have, if you have Elasticsearch configured and you try to add another server, you just get a fatal error. Even though you're like, I literally have to go into the Elasticsearch connector module and come out, comment out a bunch of code just so I can add a server unrelated to Elasticsearch. Um, and then you have to re-uncomment that code to visit the server overview page, right? So just, a, I haven't opened an issue for that one yet, I will. Um, but just a bunch of little issues like that kind of made me decide to move away from it. Um, but Elasticsearch itself is, is great. It's really stable. And I'm sure the module will, will fix those issues because it's, it's used by a lot of people. So just... Uh because I was I was not 100% following there. Elasticsearch, are you using Search API to connect to Elasticsearch or it oh, yeah. comes with its own own module for Drupal? So there, there's an Elasticsearch API module, but there's also an Elasticsearch connector module that's required. Um, okay. So that you can, because you need to connect Drupal to the cluster that's serving Elasticsearch and then Search API connects to that. Mm -hmm. and, and that's always the preferred method of connecting to an external server, at least in my experience, right? Is like, if you have a search API, like a sub module or extension that you can use, that's always, that's always the best way to go. I think, yeah. do you guys agree with that? Yeah, absolutely. Yep. And then, so, uh, you know, one thing I have a client who's, I'm going to switch from, again, their Drupal site, but they're not using this for their Drupal search part just yet. Um, they're looking to switch from Elasticsearch to OpenSearch because they're on AWS hosting. And so OpenSearch is a Elasticsearch fork by Amazon, essentially. Um, it's less maintained, I would say. Um, but again, that's another kind of up and coming service. It shares a lot of similarities between itself and Elasticsearch. Um, but again, you know, uh, things kind of uh, trickle down. There's less module usage, things like that. So um, yep. something to think about there. You know, there are other options depending on your like, you know, infrastructure and what's available to you. Yeah, I was I was working with a client that used Elasticsearch very heavily when Amazon released OpenSearch and kind of just started migrating stuff. It's, at least when I used it, it was fairly drop-in. I'm sure all mm -hmm. the Elasticsearch modules will work with OpenSearch because it's just Amazon mm -hmm. trying to I think get more control of the source code. Yep. Okay. And finally, the one that you probably have all been waiting for us to talk about because it's kind of been taking the Drupal world by storm, and that is Algolia. Have you guys used Algolia? Oh man. I 
I love Algolia. Um, and I've, so admittedly I've, I've only used, used it once, uh, and it was for a project probably, oh, I don't know, over a year ago now. So I'm sure it's probably come a long way since then, but, um, you know, Algolia is, um, an API first search platform. So basically the way that it integrates or the way that I've integrated it with Drupal is that the, um, uh, and I think Nick has actually used it more recently, so he can uh, he can uh, he can course correct me here if need be. But basically, the search API module just connects your site to Algolia and provides a method for indexing. It doesn't actually provide any any front end uh, integration um, to Algolia um, the way that I previously had used it. So Algolia was our search backend. Search API module was indexing our content back to Algolia. And then um, our front end developers actually built a React component to pull the data out of Algolia and use it on the front end. Um, the reasoning yep. for this is super fast. Like it was mm -hmm. lightning, lightning speed um, to be able to uh, get the React component on the page and then load data um, in like near real time, which was really, yep. really nice. Sean, what about you? Uh, I haven't had uh, actual hands-on uh, implementing it, but I've used it across sites that have used it. Do like the feature set? Um, have a, have looked into it in the past. Um, yeah, just never pulled the trigger. <laughs> oh, so yeah. So as John said, I, I did just finish integrating this into the site. So the the hobby project that I just mentioned that was using Elasticsearch, I just switched over uh, over the weekend to Algolia. And it, I, I did run into a couple of couple of issues or a couple of things that were gotchas. Nothing, nothing major. Um, I think one of the big ones is you still use Search API to do the connection to Algolia. You still use Search API to define which fields you want to send over, um, and you know how how they should be. So, for example, if you're sending over taxonomy field, do you want to send the taxonomy ID or do you want to send the name? Right. Um, in most cases, you probably want to send both. What you don't want to do, and this may have just been my implementation, but I found that a lot of the stuff that you usually do in Search API, like the tokenization and quarter summer stuff, you don't want to do in Drupal. You just want to send over the full amount of data to Algolia. Because um, yep. I found that it was pulling E's randomly out of all the words. So, and that was what was actually indexed. I took that away and it started working fine. So I would, I would recommend you just handle that. The other piece, and again, I don't know if there's a good way to handle this outside of that. All of the ranking and stuff that you normally do in Search API, you just do it directly in Algolia. You say, I yeah. want this field to be searchable, this field to be searchable, this one has precedence over that one, et cetera. That all happens so, in Algolia. So I kind of found that nice. And, I, and, and I'm sure people have different feelings on this, right? Because there are people that are like, no, everything should be in Drupal. It's like one-stop shopping, right? It's great. But like, I actually found it really nice to be able to like pull the data out of Drupal into Algolia. Like there are search analytics in there. There's, um, you know, the ability to set up, you know, certain filtration and, and, and search rankings and things like that. And like, it kind of gave you like a dashboard to be able to kind of control your, your search output a little bit, especially yeah. in like our use case where we had the React component. It was kind of like, you know, already pulling certain things from Algolia and like it was kind of a known entity. Like, hey, if I add a new search filter, it's just going to show up in the component, right? Right. Um, yeah. So like that aspect of it was pretty cool. I think the the analytical aspect of it was kind of cool for me too. like being able to see like, OK, well, this keyword is ranking really high. Um, like when somebody searches for this, they typically go on to search for some, this other thing. So then yeah. being able to kind of do the suggestions and stuff like that was um, was pretty interesting. Of course, you know there's uh, there's a cost associated with it you know it's not a free it's not a free utility but um you know part of me you know 
compares it to like, if you're, you know, you're looking at solar, obviously solar is open source. You have to host solar somewhere in most cases. Um, and then like, as we talked about it, like you kind of get a, a little bit, and at least in my opinion, a little bit more ease out of the box with Algolia um, than you would with, with solar. So I think as, as Sean said earlier, you know, uh, it depends, it depends what your use case is. It depends what your situation is, but, um, yeah, I definitely, as you can probably tell, am a big fan of Algolia. Yeah, one of the downsides of having that all in Algolia is you lose config management, right? But I mean, I I don't think that that's a a huge deal. Like it's it's super easy to modify and tweak things in Algolia. Um, the the other big thing about it is you have to write your own integration with it for the actual searching, right? So you can't, right? Th there's no drop in like creating a view to pull the stuff in. You can actually still create the index view and it will return results. I, I don't know what it's returning results on though. I think it's pulling them directly from the database. So I think you kind of get a faux database backend if you use a view. Integrating with our API was pretty straightforward. I mean, it took me, I don't know, a couple of hours to write a custom module that just I use the, I know a lot of people use the React plugin, but I use the PHP one because I didn't want the type ahead stuff that is, because one of the things that people don't realize is if you do the type ahead and like the auto search, auto complete, it's doing a search on every character. So it can blow up your search queries pretty quickly. And if you're trying to keep those down, then you want to use something more server side. But yeah, you, it, it was pretty easy to set up. It took me a couple hours to create a custom module that used the API. Um, it was returning results. And most of that was creating the form and the facets that I wanted for the search. Not really, not really setting up the API side. The API side was, I don't know, maybe 20 minutes. It was easy. It was really easy. Well, again, I think that goes to what John was saying. Like it's a, it's a, it's about who's, who is your team, right? Who's your search team, right? Is mm -hmm. it marketers? Yeah. Is it developers? Are they front and the front end? Are they back end developers? Like that's going to, go a long way in choosing one of these platforms, I think, um, as we discussed. So I think one other uh, search uh, utility um, service provider uh, to discuss is um, somebody I think that's relatively new to the Drupal space um, or has or has come onto the scene, I guess, in the last couple of years, which is um, Search Stacks. Uh, and they provide kind of managed solar um, searching. Uh, they do have a search API uh, integration and, um, you know, they're, they're actively working on, on improving that, uh, that experience, yep. but they do have um, two methods of, uh, you know, of service that you can get from them. So like, again, if you didn't want to like manage your own solar um, or you were looking for something that might be a little bit of a, of a more reasonable option where somebody's kind of managing the solar for you, that might be, that might be a good resource. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think they give you some tools for actually building better UIs, um, which I think is yeah. the, one of the big selling points there is, you know, you're yeah. not using views to do this thing. Uh, you're not also hand coding it uh, artisanally yep. with like Algolia. Um, yep. You're getting some components out of the box that you can kind of stitch together. Nice UIs. Yeah. That was one yeah. thing that they they um, they asked me to review their Drupal module uh, a while back, and and I was kind of like, hey, it'd be cool if there was a block that I could just drop in that kind of had your your UX widget already uh, in mm -hmm. it, and like, you know, so I, I don't know if they've added that to their module yet, but like, it's super easy, you know, it's drag and basically copy and paste of code into your into your front end. Um, I actually did a. POC of it um, a couple months ago, and I was I, I was able to kind of get that experience of like, hey, I'm typing in the search box now. I'm going to a search page in Drupal, and it's like pulling in those those um, the yeah. widgets that they have. So it is pretty pretty straightforward in that regard. And, and I will say, probably the biggest thing with all these options, like if you're doing database solar, Elasticsearch, Open Search, that kind of thing, you're generally paying per server and for the resources, right? Yep. So you might pay 40 bucks a month or 80 bucks a month, you know, whatever for these search as a service ones, the setup is a lot easier. You don't have to worry about security Well, you have to worry about security, but you don't have to worry about security of the physical machines. Like mm -hmm. that's part of the service you're paying for. Um, but you have to kind of analyze your search requirements because you pay by 
usually both the index size and um, the search volume. Right. So, uh, you know, if you, and most of these systems have some sort of payment protection thing. So like you can tell Algolia, for example, hey, don't bill me more than 50 bucks a month or warn me once we get within $10 of, you know, something, something like that. So you can kind of keep some eye on it. Avoid but, the $7,500 search yeah. bill at the end of the month. Yeah. And I presume that it just stops working if you reach that limit, but it's better than like John said, getting a, a giant bill that you weren't expecting <laughs> yeah. because you get more popular. But most, most of them are both usage and index size mm -hmm. based. Oh, hopefully they don't just display a message to your users like, Hey, this site's too cheap to pay for more search. So wait until next month. There was something recently where somebody was like, uh, I forget what it was. Where it's like, when you hit a threshold, it would have a message like tip the person so they can pay for more. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> oh, the internet. So I think we, we started talking, um, or Nick mentioned a couple of modules earlier that you can use to kind of improve uh, search indexing, right? Like um, uh, Porter Temmer, Stemmer and, and things like that, right? Uh, I think there are other modules though. There's like a, a wide array of mo a array of modules um, that you can add to improve your search, both backend indexing wise and front end, you know, user experience wise. Um, I wanted to spend some time talking about some of those because I think, you know, one of the things I always love hearing is like what, what modules people are using and, and how they're using them. Um, so Sean here, the first one is kind of near and dear to, uh, to, I think everybody that uses Drupal search, mm -hmm. uh, their heart, right. Is, uh, the facets module. Can you just give us an overview of what that does? Yeah. So facets, uh, essentially kind of builds out these little, um, blocks uh, more or less uh, that give you like selectable options, right? So like think like better exposed filters, but search, right? Uh, is probably the easiest way to think about it. Or if you've ever been on Amazon and you want a red t-shirt that's a size large, right? And it's only, you know, 20 to 40 bucks. Those are things that are like visually you think of as um, facets, right? They're these nice little controllers for filtering down things. Um, and so facets module essentially gives you an API to, to set these things up with your backend and then expose them as your, and as part of your search interface. Um, you know, it's, it's super handy, you know, you know, commerce obviously needs things like this. Right. But I can think of a lot of other cases where we use them, um, depending on how they look, you know, some of them are links, some of them are check boxes, some of them are, you know, range sliders, all those fun things that you have. Um, but you know, again, it's, uh, topics it's you know how frequently how you know filter me down everything that was posted last year right is a nice good example of uh, a facet that you know yeah. people use out of the box a lot it's interesting when when talking about facets specifically with commerce i always describe it as like shopping for a toilet at lowe's right so like you go to the plumbing section and you're like okay do you want like a rounded toilet or an elongated toilet or like do you want high efficiency do you want this and you just go through and like check all mm -hmm. the check boxes like oh it has to be has to be white it has to be round it right. has to have like this this kind of usage and so on and so forth well and, um, yeah and i think again a lot of its configuration too right like so like it's not just that you have all these options but those options can play different ways with each other right so if i do right. this it's gonna you know have these you know consequences to the search interface or you know, right. Uh, Dependencies and whatnot. Yeah. Right. So like, Hey, if you, if you select this, this taxonomy, like this other taxonomy may not display because it's not relevant. Mm -hmm. Right. Yep. Um, so I think that's definitely useful from uh, a front end perspective and building out those really comprehensive uh, search experiences. Um, yeah, what other, I, go ahead, Nick. I've, yeah. I have one more thing to add about the facets. I, th I think, well, two things actually, one of them is, expanding on the responsive piece of it is it you can set up situations where you can't get a combination of facets that will give you no result right if you choose a taxonomy it can only show you other options that have still results remaining so you can't choose an option that will be like oh sorry like there's no result the other thing that is nice about it is you can also have it show 
the number of results. So if you're looking at materials or something, you have you know wood, ceramic, stone, whatever, you can see, you know, there's, and you're looking for tiles or something, right? You can see that there's 40 wooden tile results and 10 ceramic tiles and one stone tile, right? Um, and, and they can go across different taxonomies. So if you're looking at, if you're looking at color first, for example, then you, you, you can, uh, you, you can do those facets against each other. Um, and that's one of the most powerful pieces, I think, of search API and Drupal search. The problem is you lose that with Algolia. Um, you can, you can set up faceted searches, you can set up faceted responses, you can do all that, but you have to do that yourself on your your integration, you're not going to be able to use the facets module with Algolia. That's good to know. Yeah, I mean, again, you know, a lot of this is, you know, trying to figure out what you actually need in your search UI. And I think, you know, something, something I'd say, like, a lot of these other modules, or even the back ends, like search is much more than just like the site search with a little magnifying glass, right? Like, I think, when I think about search on a site, there's a lot of places where, you know, you could you could use views directly, right? But you can use a search API and not have that, you know, database hit or storage or things of that nature that like, yeah. or you get facets because you have this thing and it would be a pain to do it in better exposed filters, right? So like, I think there's a lot of places in a Drupal site or any website really that are search interfaces that we don't typically consider search, right? In some weird way. So I think the next one here on our list is um, one in my head that I always install when people say like, I, I want my site to work like Google, right? Because like that's, that's usually what, I don't know, whenever somebody talks about search, that's, that's kind of what they're comparing it to always, right? Um, and that's the search API autocomplete module, right? So um, that one's pretty self-explanatory, but um, or at least I think it is. But uh, Sean, can you give us a little overview of what it does and, and specifically how you've used it in the past? Sure. So yeah, like John said, it's the uh, kind of type ahead feature that you get in Google, like where you start typing F and then it gives you Facebook, right? And then if you type like FO, it'll say Food Network or whatever it is, right? Like it'll start filtering down and suggesting things to you essentially based on what you type. Um, you can configure it to require three characters and different things. So you're not constantly giving people results that are irrelevant. Uh, you can kind of choose which fields populate that thing too, which I think is pretty important. It could be titles. It could be, you know, the authors of a piece of content, uh, it could be tags, right? So you can, you can supply different things to that search API autocomplete. And that's what I've used it for in the past is like, oh, well, we need more than just the title. We need the title and the subject and the author and this other thing um in that in that autocomplete but again i you know at the end of the day it's about getting your user to the result they want faster right so they don't have to type out you know some you know 20 word title they can just click it right or something you know yeah and, and it's more it's using the search api backend so it's more sophisticated than kind of the core autocomplete fields yep. where the core autocomplete fields generally have to be a little bit more um what you're typing has to be a little bit closer to what the actual results are than the autocomplete stuff yep. uh, can be. And I, I, I find it especially helpful for long lists, right? So for example, if you're, if you're setting up a search experience and, and you want to be able to filter on two different content types, right? Article versus research paper or something, right? You can just make a checkbox or a radio that says, hey, search only this or search only that. But if you're trying to filter on a taxonomy that has 250 terms, well, <laughs> a drop down list or checklist is not going to cut it, except in very, very specific use cases where somebody needs really fine control and they're kind of an audience that can, can handle that. You know, autocomplete is going to be much better in that case because nobody's going to look through a list of 250 items on a drop down to, to find what they need. And, and search autocomplete, uh, search API autocomplete is perfect for that. For sure. So, Sean, any other modules that that you like that help improve search? 
Uh, yeah, you know, I think um, this search API exclude module is helpful when things need to be excluded for a variety of reasons uh, from your search interfaces. Um, that's super helpful. Uh, like, oh, we can't surface this thing for some reason with a copyright holder or something, right? We can't have it on our website in, in the search. It can be a piece of content, but it can't be in the search or something bizarre like that that happens uh, from time to time. Um, or it's just not relevant. There's other there's other modules too that like will limit like what bundles uh, get included and things like that. So you know, again, I think it's a lot of it is customizing it for that specific use case that somebody has. I know Martin has a, a handful of search API yes. modules too uh, that um, you know help with like user term things, right? Like so, if like the user is a you know, philosophy professor, then you're going to surface them philosophy things versus if they're a history professor, you're going to surface them history things, right? So there's like other ways of boosting content, um, you know, and I think that's a lot of what the other, the other search API kind of modules or, you know, search modules go to like juxtaposing the core piece, right? With some extra bit of information um, that I use. But again, you know, that standard set of facets autocomplete exclude less so um, really goes a long way, right? Like that's like most sites I work on are, is that handful of things. Have you, either of you, I'm interested, ever seen um, a module or know a method to um, provide suggestions to folks? Like when they're searching, you know, they type in a search term for, you um, you know, I don't know, uh, eclairs, right. And they, they, you know, it, it basically, you know, shows them like, Oh, a lot of people that searched for this term clicked on this result, kind of like predictive sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. Have you ever, have you guys seen modules to do that? I mean, a, a lot of services provide some sort of add on that does that kind of thing. That's the only time I've ever really seen that. Um, the other way that I've seen people do that is, it's a bit more manual, um, but you have like a related content uh, field on pages, and then you you just have a you just kind of index those along with it to show, hey, because you found this page, these pages might be related as well. Um, I, I think with AI coming into its own, that kind of predicted or or related content stuff is going to be a lot more common. But really, when you need to show that kind of related stuff, usually people use, like, for sites that really, really need that stuff, people use something like Neo4j, which is like a graphing. Uh, I, I have a commerce client that used that pretty extensively. Um, so it uses a graphing methodology, I think, developed by Facebook in order to determine what people will like. So it'll, it'll find a bunch of different characteristics about you as a user and then find characteristics about other users and then find things that, you know, share similar. So if you search something similar in this pool, they'll suggest mm -hmm. this other stuff based on what somebody else did. So yeah, it's, it's that, th that's one of those fields that personalization and, and suggestions can, it, it can be fairly straightforward and manual, like the clients that just post fields and it can be, you have to have like a PhD level understanding of, computational mathematics yeah. in order to understand <laughs> it's a wide range that's kind of why i asked because like i know um we were talking about algolia earlier i know they have some sort of um like kind of like suggestion or keyword mapping where you can kind of say like hey this is what people usually click on when they search for this sort of thing um but um, i was just curious if, if either of you had seen it in specific to like search yeah. api yeah. and drupal drupal specific yep. so that was helpful not in Drupal. So search is one of those things that I think the average lay person does not realize how much complexity goes into it. Um, and it also has the issue of large companies doing it very well and seemingly effortlessly. I've certainly had clients ask me to make the search like Google. I'm sure you guys have as well. Um, and having implemented search, that's one of the reasons why I realized that Google is a $400 billion company based on search because it is complex. But 
if you have a client approach you and and kind of make that kind of statement, how do you shape that conversation? How do you um, how do you approach their expectations around search and and how that's going to work? Uh, yeah, that's the uh, the big gorilla in the room, right? Uh, it's it's a lot more fine tuning in your own setup than it is for Google, right? Google's got so many servers and so much processing and so many years of history of doing these things that like the result you're thinking of getting is the one you get. I think that's probably the number one thing that people do a lot of higher education work, right? Like, so like, well, we call it policing, but people type criminal justice, right? And we want that to come up first, right? Yeah. Instead of this blog post from like 20 years ago. Right. Like yeah. a lot of it is fine tuning that relevance. Um, and and that's a hard that's a hard long game. Right. Uh, when you're when you're managing your own search infrastructure, a lot of people back in the day used to use Google custom search engine when that was more of a thing yep. where they would just drop Google right on their website because <laughs> what could go wrong? Um, uh, you know, but I think, again, it's a lot of like expectation setting like like what is a good search experience measuring it that I think a lot of people just kind of set up a search and then it's just, well, we need site search and then nobody uses it <laughs> Yeah, and they don't well, measure it. And then, you know, Oh, we need a completely different thing. Right. Like it becomes, you know, a three year later idea. Yeah. I think, I, th I think there's a couple of big things. One is, you know, one of the first things I always bring up when they bring up Google, I bring up budget, right. Mm -hmm. Google spends billions of dollars a year hiring hundreds of engineers that specialize just in search and that kind of stuff. And so I bring up, you know, budget for, you know, the, 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 what's the return on the investment going to be based on the amount of time and money that you invest in the search. Like we can get a search that works perfectly the way you expect to, but we may need to put a couple other engineers on the project to do that. We're not going to have to spend billions like Google because we're also just indexing one site, but we are going to have to invest a lot of time. Um, and where's that line, right? The second thing, and this is a bit more nuanced, but a conversation that I try to have with clients about search is many times they know the content. So they're searching something and expecting a specific piece of content to show up, mm -hmm. but that doesn't occur with Google in general. When you search for great muffins to bake on Google, you don't know every single muffin website out there and every single muffin recipe, you know, which one actually is the best. You're just like, you're just searching muffin recipes. And as long as you get some muffin recipes back, you're happy. Right. And that's true of most users on the site. If they search policing or criminal justice or something like that, as long as they get some results around that, they don't know that there's another page that may be more relevant. Now that's not to say we don't strive for, closing those gaps and fixing that. That's one of the reasons why um, we we do customized search. But end users using your site, don't they're using search because they don't know the site. So as long as you're giving something that's generally relevant, they will have a satisfied experience. Um, and if they need more information, they can always refine mm -hmm. the search. People think because Google is returning a result to them based on a search quickly, that it is the most accurate search. And the, and the truth is Google indexes something like 2% of the internet. It, <laughs> it seems like everything's on Google, but it's not. They don't index even a significant portion of the internet. Um, but you don't see the rest of it because it's not indexed. You don't know what you don't see. Right, for sure. And I think, you know, again, that closeness, like you talked about to the content, really does skew the expectations uh, of the internal users versus the end users. Um, you know, and so user testing, I think, is a really important part of this too, right? Like having people test that if, if it's a site search, the site search or a specific feature search, if it's like a slice of, you know, a, the, the feature is a search interface, but it's not like searching everything on your website. Um, I think is really important because it can it can give you some information to go back to clients to kind of say, oh, well, you know, uh, I was doing a site, right? And that was comparing Google, you know, um, you can check Google Trends and like what people search for, right? And so, you know, it, it was this one term, but everybody was searching for this other term, right? 
And so it's like, well, your content doesn't have that term in it. That's why you're not coming up in Google, but also on your own website, like people aren't necessarily looking for the thing you think they're looking for. So like your internal semantics may need to be adjusted to have the thing that people are actually searching for. Um, you know, instead of this specific word you combination that you've come up with, um, you know, again, you know, going back to higher education, okay. is it policing, is it criminal justice, is it some other thing, um, you know, and, and trying to make sure that the reality of what the end users are doing is really what you want to give them, right? Uh, and, and helping your client yeah. understand I think, that. I think it's a hard part. I think, I think that, that to me, like, it boils down to, like, getting good search metrics, right? So, like, being able to understand what your users are looking for. And I think that kind of goes hand in hand with what Nick was saying. Like you can, you can spend the money to build something like Google. Right. But like, ultimately you still might not get the result that you want because you know, you don't understand your users and how they're, how they're using your site or you have a misconception about them. So I think like as much as you want to like improve your search, make your search the best it can be, you should also make sure that you're getting metrics on how users are using those those search uh, tools and and how you can kind of build them better to, to improve those results yeah, yeah for it, sure. oh go ahead <laughs> no, sorry sean i was just gonna say sometimes the answer to isn't better search like if you find 80 percent of people on your site are searching for one thing and going to one page and that page isn't in your main menu <laughs> then well, then sometimes it might just be put it in your main menu and make it more, funny make it more prominent right. It's funny you say that because for a long time, I actually believed that like search may not be necessary on websites if your content architecture made sense and was logical and usable by folks. Um, and then I quickly got to the point that like people are lazy and like they're just going to type something into a search box as opposed to trying to find it in a in a navigation. Um, so. Like I, I couldn't agree more, Nick. Like if you're, if people are, you see somebody come into your site and searching the same thing over and over again, and that page is buried three levels deep. Like maybe you want to bubble that back up to the top. I will Sean, say one something? thing I was going to, yeah, just if you do use search API autocomplete, there is a separate module that helps you track that in Google analytics. Um, oh, cool. So that's something to, to know oh, about. Oh, like oh. The, otherwise you won't get that because it's doing Ajax requests or whatever the heck it's doing. Um, yep. You won't, you won't see that in your, in your, in your metrics. So again, you, you don't, you know, you don't know what you don't measure, right? I'd like your thoughts on something, Sean, and I don't think this is a technical term or anything, but um, it's something I think about, call, I call segmented search versus unified search, right? And I'm wondering if this is something you do all the time or something you try to shy away from. What I mean by that is, you know, unified search is pretty straightforward, right? You have a search box on a page, uh, on maybe in the header, Somebody searches there, maybe there's like an advanced search drop down where they can add a couple of facets versus a segmented search, which is um, in search API terms, you create a completely separate index for something. Like maybe you have an index for articles and an index for users. So basically somebody's searching that field that will only get results from that specific um, topic. Right. They can't get like maybe it's still just a text search. Like you can still add facets if you want, but maybe it's a way to kind of segment search into different results based on what people know that they're looking for. Um, is that something that you do a lot? Is that something that you never do? Uh, it's not something I've never done. Uh, it's actually something I'm looking at doing for a client right now. Everything's in the one to next, but like, you know, this one type of content really is special has its own search interface like why is it climbing up all the other stuff right like why do we have all these other fields that aren't relevant to those content types where you know the rendered html is fine for like you know these other more didactic content types versus this more bespoke um product um you know so that there there for sure are reasons that you would need need to split it i think you know simplification like being able to test things and see how they impact that you know those different segments instead of you know doing it for everything i think is pretty key um you know and like maybe you want to handle the title differently for a product versus the title for every other piece of content on your website right the way you stem it or things like that right um yep. i think it's pretty important so like yeah i can totally see the value of doing it 
um, you know, I think it's, I think it's, it really, again, depends on, is it just the box <laughs> yeah, <laughs> on your exactly. website or are you really using, is search used in multiple places, even if that page isn't called a search page, right? Like, and I think that's, yeah. you know, a powerful thing that you get you know, where you can spin up as many pages, search pages as you want, really, uh, in Drupal, um, you know, and customize them and have them have different things. And, you know, again, you know, is it, you know, is there a benefit? I think, ultimately, is it simpler to deal with? Is it simpler to maintain? Yeah. Uh, not mess up, I guess, is probably the other big one there, whether you split it or not. It's interesting because I've, I've seen this kind of uh, scenario uh, from a different angle, one where like you have a, a large company or organization that has either different products or units that all have their own websites and folks are like, well, do we do a unified search, like search all our sites and then a site specific search, like search this site and, you know, it, it, that conversation always goes kind of down, down some rabbit holes. I think, um, I, I don't know that there's one, one answer that satisfies everybody, but, um, one thing I have seen that I think is actually pretty interesting on that unified search is different styling for different content types, right. Or different iconography for different content types. Um, and, um, you know, that can sometimes be, be useful, um, or, or like some sort of pre-selection where you could say like, Hey, I'm searching for this thing. And, yep. you know, it kind of gives you additional filters, um, going back to like facets, right. If you're, you're looking for documents versus, you know, actual content pages. Um, but I just realized as I was replying to or saying that, that, um, I may have introduced some accessibility issues with, you know, adding iconography to search results. Um, so that leads me to my next question. Um, Sean, have you, do you have any, or have, in the past, have you uh, had to do anything um, to kind of make search more uh, accessible or more, more um, uh, ally uh, friendly, if you will? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think all the all the same caveats that go with uh, building things on the web that are accessible go to search, right? You know, form inputs, labels, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, uh, the autocomplete thing, having it talk back to you, I think is pretty important. So you know, like what you're getting, like those drop downs are notoriously not accessible. Uh, in, in a lot of instances, if you use like a chosen or something like that, uh, like a selector, uh, instead of, you know, the giant, you know, list of 250 uh, check boxes for a taxonomy term. Um, and again, you know, I think it's a lot of it is education, right? Uh, besides just the coding, you know, aspect of it is like client education to make sure that they're still putting alt text on images that you might show in the search results or whatever it might be. Sure. Um, you know, again, I think I'm as long as, I'm assuming your, testing as your markup too, is right? good. I'm assuming testing too, right? Like, you know, you, you can have all the best intents, but you also want to test out those things. Yeah. Oh yeah, for sure. I mean, we use uh, a module maintained um, by the folks at Princeton and some other, some others called editorially and the Ali is a 11 mm -hmm. Y. Uh, and that's really good for like editors of a site because they can see quickly like, Oh, my heading orders out or uh, I don't have alt text or the link in this snippet makes no sense mm -hmm. because it's truncated or whatever it might be. Right. Like, so I think, you know, making it more, uh, present to all users, I think is, is a uh, key, especially the editorial team, like, cause they're the, they can stop a lot of the, of, of the issues just by making good content. Right. Uh, even with search, you know, and then it's up to the developers or whoever's implementing the search to make sure they're still following all the best practices around labels and, you know, uh, descriptions and things like that. Okay, before we wrap up the show, is there, are there any common search pitch pitfalls you'd like to let our listeners know about? Uh, yeah, for sure. I think my, my number one I see over and over and over again is people set up solar. <laughs> 
uh, and then still have their views render things from the database. And it's like, well, you just missed a giant reason to use this module uh, that will have a have a big impact on your site, right? And so, you know, I think that's pretty. It's a pretty high one. Is like they had enough. You know, the developers had enough uh, knowledge to set up Search API. They set up Solar because Solar came with their service or whatever it is. They set it up. They still built their views without using Solar directly. And so they're not getting 100% of the benefit that they could. Uh, that's for sure one. Um, I also think like, you know, the pitfall is they built something that they didn't need, right? They overcomplicated it or they underbuilt like the feature, right? It's never, there's always fine tuning that has to happen. I feel like people rarely get it right on the first try. Yeah. Um, because, you know, it requires real users to use the thing and you to go back and forth. And a lot of people say, well, we need site search. And then there's a site search and then they set it and forget it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I, I think spending too much time fine tuning search before actually testing it is, is a big one. And the one you said, I, I almost, and I'll admit for the side project, I almost did it with Algolia because I was sick of reconfiguring the index over and over again. <laughs> um, and indexing enough to get to results that actually would show the thing I was tweaking. But the truth is, yeah, you need to set whatever you want to render in the results. Those are that's something that you have to send in the search key. So, like I mentioned earlier, if you're sending a taxonomy term, many times you want to send both the ID and the name, right? Because somebody's mm -hmm. going to search the name. But when you're displaying the results, you probably want to use the term ID for the link. Right, because you yep. don't want to have to do a query to find out what the term ID is in order to send them to that category if they need to go there, um, or if you're doing a, a a facet or a filter, you know sometimes you want to use the ID instead of the term. Although with Algolia, mm -hmm. it, it kind of works the same way either way. So it's not a huge deal. But really, if you want to show something in your results, you need to send it to the index, even if it's not something that's actually searched by the end user because that will get sent in the response and right. then you can use that without going back to the database. Right. Yeah. I mean, there's so many, there's so many levers to pull <laughs> in the, in the yeah. search API interface that, uh, you know, I, I think people forget to pull some of the more important ones sometimes too, right? Like how frequently do you do index, right? Like how do you index? Do you hit the button or do you use Drush, right? Like there's a lot of, there's a lot of things in, in, in the ecosystem that, um, you need to you need to be knowledgeable about or have somebody you know where you can lean in if you jump into the Drupal oh. search uh, you know channel of the Drupal Slack. There, there's a lot of people who are super knowledgeable that are happy to help you uh, there. Uh, you know, so uh, I think you just, you just reminded me of two more actually. One is <laughs> remember if you have a site of any size, you do not want to index immediately or track reference content, right? If you do mm -hmm. either of those. Your site will grind to a halt, even if you're not doing a database search. Um, I ran into that issue with, um, I, I had inadvertently turned on index immediately and was running a migration where I was migrating 80,000 items. And so it was, every time it hit one, it tried to index it. And yeah, things ground to a halt. It was very slow. I, I've ran into that migrate issue where it indexes <laughs> while you're migrating. And it's like, right, no, I'm not done yet. <laughs> this migration takes forever. Um, the other one is when you're rendering content, it's as if a user is rendering the content. Um, and I had an issue where I, I had some fields that could only be filled in with an API call. And the API has a limit of two calls per second. And I was like, oh, I don't really have to write any protection because I'm never going to hit. I like It only hits if I manually visit it. And again, this is my side project. I only ever manually visit pages every so often. I'm not going to be visiting more than one every two, two every second. So I don't have to write any protection. Well, search API, <laughs> when it renders the content, it goes, oh, it's rendering. We need to hit the API to get the data that's missing. Um, so I get temporarily banned from that API for 24 hours until I wrote, <laughs> I was a good citizen and actually wrote uh, API protection. So, so one of the things is if you're rendering content, um, it's the same as users hitting that content. Mm -hmm. And if you're index content 50 at a time, you need to make sure that you're capable, of, your, your server is capable of doing that as well. Um, so yeah, a cu couple pitfalls. We, we've all hit them. Um, don't worry about I, if you hit them. But and the number to... one thing that always happens is they can still be cached. 
right? So like that exact param with the search term with those filters yeah. can be cached. And if you're not, if you don't have good caching set up, clear, clearing, uh, and your client's going, I just edited this thing. And it's been a half hour. I'm still not seeing it as the first result. Right, like there's still the number one Drupal caveat of all common pitfalls is you still yeah. got to clear the cache sometimes. Yep. Yeah, I think one one aspect from like a pre-project, uh, you know, a pre-project point of view there is if you know search is going to be a big part of your project in discovery, ask for common search cases that that you're trying to solve for, you're trying to improve for, right? Um, I, I think that's something that a lot of people kind of uh, don't do or, or forget to do. Um, and then they get to building this thing and they build it and they present it and the client's like, oh, well, it doesn't work for this, that, you know, this is one of the problems we wanted to try to solve. Well, make sure you ask those questions up front, you know, ask those yep. questions in discovery, because that can be a can be a test case for you while you're working on search. Well, does it meet this test case? Okay, it does. Good. Um, so I definitely, I definitely think that's a, that's an important one that some folks kind of miss as well. Uh, well, Sean, thank you for uh, chatting with us today. It has been um, very educational, and um, hopefully, we've helped to uh, improve Drupal search for our listeners. Do you have questions or feedback? You can reach out to Talking Drupal on Twitter with the handle Talking Drupal or by email with show at TalkingDrupal.com. You can connect with our hosts and other listeners on Drupal Slack in the Talking Drupal channel. You can promote your Drupal community event just like Design for Drupal did today. To learn more on how to do that, go to TalkingDrupal.com slash TD promo. And you can get the Talking Drupal newsletter to learn more about our guest hosts, show news, upcoming Drupal camps, local meetups, and much more. You can sign up for the newsletter at TalkingDrupal.com slash newsletter. And thank you, patrons, for supporting Talking Drupal. Your support is greatly appreciated. You can learn more about becoming a patron by going to TalkingDrupal.com and clicking that big Become a Patron button. Alrighty, we've gotten to the end of our show. Um, Sean, before you tell folks where they can find you and uh, and chat with you, um, I'd like to thank you again for joining us for the last three weeks. And um, yeah, come back and uh, visit us soon. Will do. It's been a real pleasure pleasure to see how uh, Talking Drupal is made, uh, and uh, you know, be here to chat with you all and all the guests. Um, you can find me uh, at Sean T. Walsh on most things, uh, Drupal.community, the Mastodon instance, uh, Drupal.org, uh, Drupal Slack. Um, you can find my company at crowdcg.com. Have you, have you jumped onto threads yet? No. <laughs> I need Because I'm already it. on a Mastodon instance. Okay. I'm, I'm happy where I am. There you go. What happens. Way, to, way to be. Way to be. <laughs> Nick, what about, what about you? Uh, you can find me pretty much everywhere at Nick's fan. Uh, I've not created a threads account yet. I'm going to probably just to park the name, but I'm so disappointed that it's app only. I, I, I am not a fan of not being able to just go to a website to log into something. So if you already parked your Instagram name, you don't have to do it because like, oh, it's the same okay. account. <laughs> oh, in that case, I will probably do nothing then. <laughs> Good to know. Appreciate that. <laughs> That's that's a little old timey of you, Nick, but, you know, that's understandable um, for our listeners. I'm John Picozzi, uh, solutions architect at EPAM. You can find me on all the major social networks at John Picozzi, uh, as well as Drupal.org. And uh, you can find out more about EPAM at EPAM.com. If you've enjoyed listening, we've enjoyed talking. Have See a good one, everyone. Week.